So, I've got one of the all-time great books. So, welcome to today's book of the day. Welcome to the show. We're going to be covering one of the greatest biographies you can ever read. In fact, if you're not sure what to read in life, start with this one. When I stop talking, you'll know I'm dead. Useful stories from a persuasive man. Jerry Weintraub. This guy's still alive. He's a legend. If you don't know who this guy is, well, I guarantee you he's influenced your life. He managed Elvis Presley, Frank Sinatra, John Denver. He went on to become one of the top movie producers. <clears throat> Have you ever seen the original Karate Kid or Ocean's Eleven, Ocean's Twelve, Ocean's Thirteen? I don't even know how many. How many do they make of that? Yeah, thirteen. Ocean oh, Thirteen. He was the producer. He's also one of the most influential men in uh, Hollywood, in media. And I like the subtitle, <clears throat> Useful Stories from a Persuasive Man. Here's the thing. I, I talk about this a lot in, in my business talks. You know, this, what I'm talking about right now, this show is all about the good life, health, wealth, love, and happiness. So it's not just about business. But let me digress for a second. If you could possess, let's say, three superpowers... Now, maybe it's easier to say if you could possess one superpower, but let's, let's be greedy here. If you could have three superpowers, what would yours be? I'll tell you what mine would be. And I'm talking about superpowers that would get you through life, that would get you what you want in life. You want an amazing life, what would you want? Number one, I'm going to go with what uh, Bill Gates and Warren Buffett both agreed on. They said if they had any superpower, they'd want to be the fastest readers in the world. Because they know something most people don't know. You'll meet people say, oh, don't get too book smart, da, da, da. No, Bill Gates and Warren Buffett are very sharp. And the proof's in the pudding. Look at their life. Bill Gates has not only become wealthy for himself, but revolutionizing the world with the Gates Foundation, his charity. Why do you think he said that? It's because he's saying he wants to be able to simulate the future without having to go through the trial and error himself. So I'm going to go with that. That's my number one. Number two... I think I might have to go with being persuasive. And you'll see why here as we go through the main uh, awesomeness, for lack of a better word, in this book. Why being persuasive is almost the greatest attribute you can have. And, I'll, and let me just say, you can be too persuasive if you're using it to manipulate people. So persuasion that moves people to the wrong direction is manipulation. Or, you know, with evil intent or whatever you want to say. But what if you or somebody had the persuasive power to convince people to not go to war? Look at every tragedy in the news. You know, I posted on my Twitter. I said, every time I watch the news, I wonder, why am I doing this? You know, but I occasionally do. I think you shouldn't watch much news. My mom told me once, most of the important things you need in life will be told to you by other people. I know that's not perfect logic, but this Pakistan, there's this tragedy where all these uh, children were killed by terrorists. Now, what prevents that? You could say, well, we need better government. We better better to this. We need better military. But at the end of the day, if somebody would have had the ability to persuade those people before they committed the act of murder... Hey guys, this isn't a good idea and here's the reason why. You would stop horrible events, you would stop war, uh, you would stop divorce, not that all divorce is bad, but you could stop needless ones, stop conflict. Everything comes down to persuasion at the social level. There's some things that wouldn't be solved by persuasion because social implies human. You couldn't convince bacteria and viruses to stop infecting humans with persuasion, all right? So there are limits. That's why I said the first two superpowers I have is ability to simulate the future without going through the trial and error myself by reading and comprehending, and number two, to be more persuasive socially, uh, hopefully around the right things. Number three, my superpower, I'm going to tell you that another day because that's a whole other conversation, and I want to get back to this book. What's the lesson? Well, 
if you're on my book of the day or if you're on an article, I'm going to kind of follow an outline I wrote about this book. Now, the greatest story in this book, I'm going to recount this. And I want you to imagine, uh, I want you to imagine this was you, okay? I want you to imagine this is you. 26 years old, Jerry Weintraub is a nobody. He wakes up, okay? Uh, and he had a dream. His dream was he was going to take Elvis Presley out on the, on the road on tour. Remember, Jerry Weintraub now is 26 in the 50s. Elvis Presley, that's like you having a dream that you're going to go, you know, manage the President of the United States or manage Lady Gaga's tour or Justin Bieber. These were, Elvis Presley was beyond big. His wife is a naysayer or was a naysayer, laughed at him and said, what do you mean? Elvis Presley doesn't even know who you are. You're a nobody. Plus, we're $70,000 in debt. That is a lot of money now, but it's a lot more money, or it was a lot more money back in the 50s, if you do the time value, you know, do inflation. So everything was against him, and Jerry Weintraub did something that I want you to notice. He created momentum. He said, I'm going to pick up the phone, and he called. So he found out the colonel was the manager, the current manager, business manager for Elvis, kind of a crazy character if you read about him. So he calls the colonel early in the morning because he had read, he did research. Remember, I talked about this in the business class uh, that I did yesterday. You got to go through the seven-step scientific process. The first one is ask a question. In Jerry's case, it was, how in the world can I take Elvis Presley out on the road? The second one is do the research. A lot of people forget number two. They forget to do the research. They just skip right to making a hypothesis. His hypothesis was he should call. But... And he tested his hypothesis. He began to call. But remember, if he hadn't done that competitive research, he wouldn't have been able to pull off what he ends up pulling off. That diametrically, or I should say, single-handedly changed the course of his entire life. This course of your entire life can hinge upon one test, one experiment that you do well. So make sure you do your experiments. If you're in the 67 steps, if you're not in the 67 steps, I'm going to pop up a button here on this video, or if you're listening, audio, make sure you go to my site and click on it. Thousands of people are going in it at a time. It looks like I'm going to have a million positive comments on the 67 steps. It's a 67-day challenge. One video a day you listen to. See if I can't, and not me, but see if you can't reformulate and rewire your entire brain. It's based on science. It's based on the teachings of the world's greatest people throughout history. It's not just, it's not me, it's you're learning from them. I'm just a messenger in that system. So one of the 67 steps, um, you know, that I talk about is this setting up experimentation. So Weintraub does his research, and as Sun Tzu says, if you know yourself, but you don't know your enemy, for every battle you win, you will lose one. One step forward, one step back. But Jerry Weintraub Listen to Sun Tzu in The Art of War when Sun Tzu said, but if you know thyself and you know your enemy, you never have to be afraid. So Jerry Weintraub knew some things. He did his research on Elvis and the colonel, and he called. And the colonel picked up the phone at 6 in the morning, said, who is this? Said, hi. Uh, Jerry said, hi, my name is Jerry. You don't know me. I'd like to take Elvis Presley out on tour. Of course, the colonel said, you're crazy, and hung up on him. And the next day, Jerry Weintraub called back at 6 in the morning, woke up maybe even earlier, 5.30 in the morning, did it again. The colonel hung up, said no, over and over and over and over. He did that for one year. Imagine making 365 phone calls of pure rejection. But yet, as Sun Tzu said, at the end, he won. The colonel answered the phone about a year later and said, you still want to take my boy out on the road? Now remember, this was a principle of persuasion that you must remember. I don't know that Jerry Weintraub realized it yet, but now we know the way the human brain works, it's something called familiarity. In the cognitive biases, it's called liking bias. It means we tend to do business with people we like. And what does it take to feel liking affection towards somebody? Well, one of the things it takes familiarity. 
So by Jerry calling once a day for 365 days, even without knowing it, he had formed a certain bond with the colonel. You see this even in the most bizarre of situations, terrorist situations. They call it Stockholm Syndrome, where the terrorists, uh, oh, I'm sorry, where the hostages end up feeling affection towards their captors. That's familiarity. So they say on average in marketing, it takes 12 touches. You have to touch people at least 12 times now before they become a buyer because people are inundated with people trying to get them, hey, like me, buy my product, do business with me. So, so often you and I had failed, not because we were on a failing path, but because we didn't give the natural cognitive biases time to kick in in the other person's brain. Jerry did, he was a patient man, 365 times and the colonel said, hey, you still want to take my boy out on the road? Jerry said, yeah. He said, then meet me in the morning with a check made out to Elvis Presley. Meet me in Las Vegas at this hotel, this uh, casino, with a check for a million dollars. Now that in and of itself would stop most of us, but Jerry already had his momentum. He had done more than 67 days. The reason I picked 67 days, that's how long it takes to rewire your brain, new habits. Jerry, by calling 365 days, that's why I'm so big on take challenges where you have to do something repetitively over and over. The great thing, I grew up on a farm for some time, 10 years. You learn every morning you, you know, milk the cow or you let the chickens out or you collect eggs. And that repetition creates in your brain neural pathways that become the new habits. While the rest of the world, ha you know what most of the world's habits is right now? Habits are checking their phone, checking Facebook wall. You know, Facebook, if it was a religion, would be the second biggest religion, a third, I sorry, after Islam and Christianity by minutes spent. I just read that, fascinating. These are the habits that people have, texting. Now, none of those things in and of themselves are bad but do they get you the end goal you want? Listening to music, average person. I saw Ollie G in his show, you know, his funny HBO show, he, he met Donald Trump. He said, what's the most popular thing in the world? And Donald Trump said, music. And he's right, music is a drug, the most powerful and the most legal of all drugs. Forget marijuana legalization, music is the most powerful. It exhibits all those characteristics of drugs. It changes your brain, releases chemicals, and is addictive. If that's not a drug, I don't know what is. Uh, anyway, Jerry had different ones. See, Jerry's not better than you or I, but he's different, and because of that, he ended up with $250 million in his bank account. He ended up living the most charmed life. I mean, he's a happy guy. You can Google him, see him on YouTube, and his interview was like on Jay Leno, or it was on Conan or something. He's happy, he's, looks, he's almost 80, he looks young. He's excited about life, he has the respect of his peers, he's healthy, what else do you want? This guy's living the good life and it's because when most people were going off to the left on that path, he went to the right. So he gets this challenge, a million bucks in the morning. Remember, in the 50s, a million dollars, if you do the time value, if you do inflationary uh, uh, calculation of what a million dollars, it's a lot of money, 10, 20 million dollars in today's uh, in today's currency. And you're talking a guy who had 24 hours at 26 years old to get it, but he already had that formula. Be persistent. So he just got on the phone and called friends and friends and friends of friends and acquaintances of acquaintances. Make sure, by the way, I'm, I got a special offer on this book. When I stop talking, you know I'm dead. Buy it from me directly. You'll get a new copy. We'll ship it out to you. You'll get it just as fast as you're going to get it. Uh, ordering it on Amazon or Barnes & Noble or Bookstone, Brookstone. Plus, I've got a whole bunch of bonuses. My insider notes on the book that I don't have time to do here. You're gonna get my six video uh, smart reading course and I've got some other bonuses. So make sure you get it here. Uh, there should be a button you can buy this. This is an amazing book. So, uh, what does he do? He keeps calling until a radio operator says, sure, Jerry. I'll give you a million bucks, I'm an Elvis fan, just pay me back after the tour. So he wires the money to a Vegas bank. This is all, remember he only has till the morning. Jerry's like on a time frame, he's calling till three or four in the morning, finally gets the money, 
or a wire to him, pulls up to a bank from the airport, walks in, says, hi, my name's Jerry. There should be a wire here for a million dollars for me, uh, for Elvis Presley. And the, wait, the uh, bank teller, of course, is like, this guy's crazy and says, wait, I gotta talk to my manager. He goes back with the manager. Sure enough, there is a million bucks there. The manager writes him out that uh, whatever cashier's check. And he says, he says, by the way, Jerry, you want me to, I'd love to come work for you. See, that guy recognized in Jerry that special spark. I always say, I can tell you meet people, they got the spark in their eye. They got the twinkle. They got the, you know, the skip in their step, that old cliche. Jerry had that. He's 26 pulling this all off. What are most people doing at 26? What are most people doing at 18? You re I read this story about this 16-year-old kid. He has a toy company making 10 million bucks a year or the guy who started the kid who started Sumley he was what 15 and he sold it for 15 million dollars you got to get the twinkle in your eye back you know most people had a big dream I'm sure you had a big dream it dies out because you don't have the execution Jerry knew how to execute on the dream everybody's I was reading this interesting book called Super Survivors. It's a, and, he, and it talks about people who went through extreme traumas, cancers. I didn't realize, you know, 10 or 20 or maybe more million people a year survive car crashes and cancer. We're at an all time high of people surviving things and what they're finding is that the people who survive and thrive, they're not always, quote unquote, the power of positive thinking people. Sometimes, in fact, they're more pessimistic. See, a lot of us have bought into this thing that the way you get your dreams is by your parents patting you on the back and saying, you're going to get your dreams and you speaking it, quote unquote, into existence. Oh, you know, some people don't even want to say anything negative. There's no proof. There's no scientific research that that's effective. In fact, almost all the scientific research, read that book, Super Survivor, says it's actually better to be a realist and to face your fears and say, no, I'm going to fail. I'm 14. I'm 40, I have a dream, I'm gonna fail. Unless I do a lot of things really well. They actually say, parents, we live in a world of too many compliments. Oh, you're gonna make it, you're gonna be. No, don't say that to your kids. Don't say that to yourself. Say, it's tough if, if I do this stuff right, if I follow the right roadmap. If I learn from people like Jerry Weintraub, who did make, if I adopt the techniques used by top mentors, if I search, if I ask, seek, and knock, then I have a chance, if fate will give me that chance. Be more humble. That's the recipe for success. Not this quick shortcut stuff where you just talk it into existence. Jerry wasn't about talk. He went out and did this stuff. Didn't matter whether he was now, you can be an optimist. I do believe in that. An optimist says, if I do all the stuff right, if I follow the path, if I have courage, if I have perseverance, if I simulate the future through mentors and books, and if fate, as Odysseus, Homer wrote about, fate passed you on the back and gives you a chance, then I got a chance. That's optimism. That's not blind, you know, delusion that so many people had. So Jerry goes... He takes that million dollar check. He shows up. The colonel, sure enough, said, let's go up to the condo. Let's go up to the suite penthouse and let's meet Elvis. He met Elvis. He shook his hand. That's how the deal was done. A handshake, not even a contract. Jerry, uh, Elvis and the colonel could have walked off that million dollars, but they kept their word. Jerry Weintraub took him out on the road, ended up making 10 million bucks. Young kid from taking, remember Elvis had stopped touring at this time with just doing those crazy movies and stuff. He got him back out. Now, what happened next? Well, let me tell you, when you do the right thing, and I define right as the efficient thing, when you begin to execute correctly with no cognitive biases deluding you, what happened next? Momentum was created. He's pushing the boulder up the hill. Next, guess what happened next? Remember though, this is a year or two later, he got a call from a relatively unknown singer. I'm saying that sarcastically because it was Frank Sinatra. He said, hey, I heard you did a good job with Elvis Presley. Will you manage me? Frank Sinatra and Elvis. How do you get bigger than that? 
Momentum was created, momentum was created, momentum was created until the next thing you know, he was the king of Hollywood, you know, on top of the world. So I want to read you something, the two takeaways that I'd like you to have from this book, and, and please read this book. It's so entertaining. It's so funny. I've given it to a lot of people, hundreds of people as gifts over the years. Every one of them has loved it. Uh... I'm giving you this, this is a, you know, make sure by the way you subscribe to YouTube uh, here, I'm going to pop up a little button, subscribe to my channel, if you're listening, audio, subscribe to the podcast, the reason being is a lot of times these deals, like these book of the day deals or different things, they're only available for a short period of time, so if you're one of the first people, if you're subscribed, you're one of the first people to get on here, you got a huge advantage to get these things, all right, now, I'm going to be talking more. There's some fascinating business things in this book. There's some reasons that Jerry Weintraub's worth 200, a quarter of a billion dollars. That's a good way to think about it. He knew persuasion. Remember I said at the beginning, the greatest tool is persuasion. If you're an entrepreneur or if you're like not yet an entrepreneur, but you're like 90% of Americans and people in the world in general who at some point want to become an entrepreneur, who have an idea in their head, but you don't know how to get people to pay attention. Or if you have a business, but you don't know how to get enough customers. I'm going to show you in a few minutes. This is the first show I do every day. 11.30 in the morning, California time. Then I'm going to do another show uh, right after. It's an online seminar. You have to register, but it's free. So click. There should be a button right here. Uh, and you can join. I'm going to be talking about how I got a million customers and how you can too. The new rules of marketing and persuasion. Before I get to that, though, I'm going to take a little five-minute break. But first, I want to keep going a little bit longer here because I want to read you something. The two lessons that I want you to take away today, number one, is persistence. Okay? There's a parable uh, in the Bible. And again, I'm not religious in these shows, but there's much you can learn from teachings that have stood the test of time for thousands of years so then Jesus told his disciples a parable to show them that they should always pray and not give up in a certain town there was a judge who neither feared God nor cared what people thought and there was a widow in the town who had come to him with the plea grant me justice against my adversary for sometimes the judge refused but finally the judge said to himself even though I don't fear God or care what people think this, with, this widow keeps bothering me. I will see that she gets justice so that she won't eventually come back and attack me. <laughs> In that parable, Jesus was saying, if you're persistent, sometimes you get what you want because people simply just go, ah, I got to give it to this person or they're going to bother me. Now, hopefully you're not annoying in the truest sense of the word, but the principle is there. As I think it was Lao Tzu who said, the temptation to give up is greatest right before you're about to succeed. You know the story in World War II. Some of you have seen uh, this new movie out that's called, what's the darn, what's the? Unbroken? No, no, the one about the World War II. Really? The Code Breaker. Oh, in, in, in Imitation? Imitation Game with, with uh, yeah, Kira Knightley. It's a story of World War II. And it's a great story if you go see that movie Imitation Game because the main character who breaks the code, he just perseveres longer. It took years for him to go. Millions or thousands of people dying a week. And he can't solve the problem of breaking Hitler's Enigma code. Right? But he persevered. And in the end, we know what happened. The Allies won in a very famous speech by a man who didn't give up. Winston Churchill, and remember the story of Winston Churchill in World War I, he had uh, initiated the attack called uh, the battle plan around Gallipoli, which is a place near Turkey, or in the Straits there, and he pushed for it, and he was disgraced because it was one of the biggest disasters for the Brit British Navy. Thirty years later, Winston Churchill hadn't given up and was still persisting and we know what happened. They won, and this is what good old Winston Churchill said. We shall go on to the end. We shall fight in France. 
We shall fight on the seas and oceans. We shall fight with growing confidence and growing strength in the air. We shall defend our island. Whatever the cost may be, we shall fight on the beaches. We shall fight on the landing grounds. We shall fight in the fields and in the streets. We shall fight in the hills. We shall never surrender. John Maxwell in 21 Irrefutable Laws of Leadership says rule number 15, leaders find a way to win. You got to find a way to win. I don't care what adversity you have. If you have tremendous health adversity or trauma, read the book Super Survivors. Read this book first. When I stop talking, you know I'm dead. Churchill said, never give in. Never, never, never in nothing great or small, large or petty. Never give in except to convictions of honor and good sense. Never yield to force. Never yield to the apparently overwhelming might of the enemy. Notice what he said there. There's one caveat. Some people are too stubborn. You may have the right, as, as uh, Nietzsche said, many people are obstinate about the path, not as many about the destination. Focus on the destination. That's why don't be persistent on a specific path. Maybe it's the wrong path. If your goal is the good life, you might be taking path number 33. You need to take path number 77. Be persistent about staying on the path. That's why Churchill says never give in except to convictions, meaning things that you might be doing that are unethical or whatever need to be tweaked, or good sense. If what you're doing is breaking good sense and other wise people around you are saying, hey, try a different path, then you should yield. But don't yield because, and the second point is, momentum gets created. And once momentum is on your side, it's almost the greatest thing that you can ever have on your side. It's amazing, the power of momentum. I'll read you something and as we close here. <clears throat> You've had dreams. You have them. Revive one of those old dreams. I, when I was 14, I wanted to play pro basketball or maybe coach or own a basketball team. Those dreams go dormant. The fears of life, the rejections in life, if you're not careful, will squeeze you down, push you down. I had a dream of public speaking. I used to do a ton of public speaking. It was a natural gift that I had for whatever reason. And for some reason, I went you know, years without doing it. Like so many people, uh, uh, we find what we're good at and we stop doing it for whatever bizarre reason. Winston Churchill said, never give up on something you can't go a day without thinking about. What are those things that have been in your mind for decades or longer? I just read this good book in this book, Super Survivors, about a woman who had gone down a corporate path, taken a nine to five job that she did not like. I think her name was Asa, Asia. And interestingly enough, she got, can I think it was cancer, and you know, survived it. And in what the interesting part is, it was such an epiphany to survive this and realize how short life was that she went back and said, "What's something I wasn't persistent and didn't get, and I gave up on?" And it was playing the violin. So she began to pick up the violin, and she said, "I always wanted to be in California on Sunset Boulevard, the you know, nice California air running through my." hair and I wanted to be able to play the violin and so she quit her job a lot of you need to quit your job I'm going to be talking about that in this business seminar in a few minutes it's all part of how you can get what you want financially and she, that's what she did she quit her job she put the fear down she did it with a plan she came to California and within 18 months she was touring with the biggest bands I forget who it was uh, but I'm talking about A-list kind of people Adele or whatever like that, touring in the viol with doing electric violin. See, that's the power, not giving up by creating some momentum, persisting, tweaking the path, okay, as the moment and common sense and honor, as Winston Churchill says, dictates, but not giving up, as Nietzsche said, don't give up on the destination, just tweak your paths. Make sure you listen to that on the 67 Steps. I've been talking more and more about that as you go through the one video a day. So I want to end 
by saying this. I've got a question for you. What is, now if you're watching this live, uh, you might not be able to do this, but if you're watch, listening to a replay or audio, or even if it is live, you can reach out to me at Ty Lopez on Twitter or on my Facebook, Ty Lopez Official. If you're on YouTube watching this video page, leave a comment. It's good to interact with these, not for my sake, for your sake. It helps it become indelibly impressed upon your brain, those things that you begin to take action or write about. So what's one thing you gave up on, not because common sense dictated you give up, not because honor and convictions, but because you simply quit persisting in? What's that one dream? Write that below. It can be small or it can be large. It can be to be the president of the United States, go to space, or it could be as small as, you know, losing five pounds. What is yours? Okay? It's a thing you haven't been able to go. Never grip on something you can't go a day without thinking about. What's yours? And number two, what's a simple thing you can do, like Jerry Weintraub just started picking up the phone. It didn't cost him anything, just a phone call. It's a simple action you can take to create momentum. It's not cheesy. People think these things are cheesy. What's cheesy about momentum? Momentum and fighting entropy and getting inertia on your side is to the core of the atomic structure of the universe that we live in. Inertia is a law of physics. This isn't some, you know, mamby-pamby invented crazy thought that I'm giving to you. This is structured at the basic elemental level and if it applies to physics it probably applies to life in general so answer that make sure you subscribe here if you're on podcast subscribe leave me a review it helps me out give me an honest review you know what you think if you don't like it say it i don't want it dishonest hopefully you like it and uh stay tuned show up on my show live 11 30 california time also, join my social, YouTube. Reach out to me at Twitter. If you have a question, I try to answer those. All right. Oh, one last thing. I, my book of the day. Go to tylopez.com. Join. Uh, I've now got the second biggest book review club in the world. It's free. It's second to Oprah. I'm going to try to catch her one of these days. And uh, you get lots of cool stuff. Quickest way to read a book a day is to get a summary sent to you, which I do. Uh, just about every day and you can spend five ten minutes a day and have all that knowledge from these books right into your head without you having to spend time reading on your own but read too buy the book and lastly i'll see you on the seminar in a few minutes i'm gonna grab some food and uh talk to you soon thanks so much